We are on a discussion of the words, many ayahs before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cited the subject or the topic of the words, mentioning the process of the words. Then after he went on to speak about suckling, in case of there's a divorce and there's a child involved, who is responsible for suckling the child, who is responsible for maintaining the mother. Then he went on, if if an individual is, if a, a man he passes away and leaves his wife, what is the idda period for her? As well if someone is pregnant, what is the idda period for that individual as well? And then we went on to mahar, the different aspects of mahar, when it should be given, if a divorce occurs, it should be taken back, how much should be taken. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tonight's ayat start from 240, is that the last two ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to speak about the topic of divorce. So this is the last two ayat, which is 240 and 241. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on that topic still. He says in 2.40, وَالَّذِينَ يَتُوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ And those who passed away from amongst you. Those of you, husbands who have passed away from amongst you, وَيَدَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا And they leave behind azwaj, they leave behind wives. وَصِيَّةً لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ Allah says that they should make a wasiya, a will for their wives. So you die, you pass away, before you pass away, you should make a will for your wife. Mata an ilal hawli ghayra ikhraj. And that will should be for your wife, it should have the maintenance for your wife until a year. Enough in that will should be so that your wife that you leave behind should have enough maintenance for the entire year, ghayra ikhraj, without her being expelled from your property. She she supposed to be able to stay in your property and your home even though you have passed away for an entire year. Then Allah says, in kharajna, and if she was to come out, if she was to feel like a, go back by her parents' home or to go in a different home and she don't want to stay in your property, in your home, Allah says, فَلَا عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا فَعَلْنَا There is no sin upon you, فِي مَا فَعَلْنَا in whatever she did. She says, Fima fa'ala fi anfusihinna bin ma'roof, in whatever she did with her own self with goodness. So whatever choice she chose, as long as the, the right was there that she could have stayed in your home, stayed in your property, but she decided to go elsewhere, Allah says, that is no sin upon you. You have fulfilled your right. Then it says, Wallahu Aziz and Hakim, and Allah is Aziz and Allah is Hakim, Allah is the mighty, Allah is the wise. This ayat was one of the first ayahs that was revealed. It teaches us that in the days of Jahliya, there were certain practices which we mentioned last week. That when an individual passes away, the, the mourning period for the wife was one year. So in those days before Islam came, a husband passes away, his wife had to be in that waiting period for an entire year. And not only that, but she was not able to inherit anything from the husband. So when he passes away, she has nothing to get. That's why in the days of Jahili and the days of ignorance. And even she herself was considered to be a merchandise or a property of the husband. That those, the inheritors, will normally give, give her to whoever they please it to. So when Islam came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it in stages. So this ayat still holds the fact of one year, but it removed that of no inheritance and placed inheritance in it. 
So Islam came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of just making it one thing and say, I'm going to remove this one here, I'm going to remove no inheritance, I'm going to give them inheritance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leave the one year, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but they need to inherit, they need to leave a will for them. He takes away that one point from it. And if you look in this ayah, there's two main points. One is the year. You have to remain in your home for a year. You have to leave enough money to maintain them for an entire year. So that is the one thing of one year mourning period or one year is the period. The second point is that they need to get a wasiya will. But these two points have already been mentioned in different ayahs, which makes this one being abrogated. So this ayat is not, uh, the law pertaining to this ayat is not there again. Because the law of one year was abrogated by the ayat which is yet previously. When Allah says, يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنْفُزِهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَأَشْرًا That they should stay with themselves for four months and ten days. So when that ayat came down, the, the year was, was called off. There is no one year again for it, the period. So with that ayat abrogated the law of one year. Next about the inheritance, Allah says wasiyatan, you should leave for them a wasiya will, but that was also abrogated by the laws of inheritance in Surah Al-Nisa. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that the wife, the among that the wife has to inherit, that means as long as the wife is already inheriting from the husband, then the husband do not have to leave a separate will for her. So she already has the right to inherit from him. If she's taken one eighth or a quarter of his property already that belongs to her, then nobody could expel her from the home because she has a, she has a portion for herself already. So this, by making a, a, a separate wasi and a separate will, has been abrogated as well. So both of the laws that is in this ayat in verse 240, it is not applicable again because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent other ayat which abrogate it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Walil mutallakati mata umil ma'ru haqqan ala al mutakin. This is the last ayat Allah is dealing with divorce now, which is verse 241. Allah says, and for the mutallakat, for those wives who have been divorced, mata umil ma'ru, they should have maintenance with goodness. They should be maintained with goodness. Means that they should be given a special gift. They should be given a special gift. You know, for example, we talk about a mahar. Be it if they, you have given them a mahar or you did not give a mahar, or how much of the mahar you have to give them in certain situations, Allah is saying, even though put aside the mahar, you are going to divorce your wife, you and your wife are going to separate, let it be done in a very good way. Let, it no be, let there not be any kind of hatred or any kind of enmity among you and your wife. When you are leaving her to go, leave her to go with the entire mahar as well as putting an additional gift for her. And each person on their own, if you are rich, you give them something that is applicable to your wealth status. If you are poor, you give them something, but give them something extra. So that they will know that this is not no hatred, it's just that we cannot live together and you go your way, I go my way. But let us live good as human beings. Let it not be that you go your way and you start to bad talk me, I go my way and I start to bad talk you with my friends. Let that not be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let it be done in a good way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this down and the scholars have the opinion that some of the opinion it is wajib to do that. And others of the opinion it is mustahab to ensure that you give them a gift before they leave. Give them something that will, will make them satisfied that they are not leaving empty handed. Because as we know, when a divorce comes, everybody is just thinking, what is mine and what is yours? And everybody is fighting for their share. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, make sure you, you give them so much that they will be pleased with you. That even though they have gone their way, they might go on, they might remarry, at least they have something to hold on to. They have something to start their life with. So you give them something, bil ma'roof, and Allah says, with goodness. And bil ma'roof here means with a urf. Orf means the norms of the people. So you, you need to look at the norms of the people. What is something good that they can able to hold on on? What, what is it that they could hold on for a year 
and they can try to get their balance back and start on their life. You need to look at the, the, the norms of the people. Then Allah says, Haqqan alal muttaqeen. This is a right on those who are God-fearing. So if you are God-fearing, you should try to practice this. If it so happens that you fall into a divorce, you should try to put it into practice. And that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the topic with divorce by advising us to make sure that when you are going to divorce, Allah does not like divorce. But if you are going to divorce, make sure it is done in such a way that there is no enmity, there is no hatred. There's no malice for you and your spouse who have just divorced. Then Allah says, كَذَارِكِ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِ Allah says, and like that, he, Allah explains to you his signs. Allah explains to you his ayats and his verses. Allah explains to you those things which are halal. Allah explains those things which are haram. Allah explains those things which are far, those things which are his laws, by all these rules which he has mentioned from before. And we started from sin. We started to talk about the rules Allah began when he started about those who kill one another. You commit murder, what is the retaliation? From then on, Allah was teaching you different laws of marriage, of divorce, of mahar, of inheritance. Laws after laws Allah was teaching. Allah says like that, he has explained his ayahs for you. And he has explained it for you so that you will, you will, you will understand it in the times of need. Whenever you come up to this situation or any of these situations in your life, you have the Qur'an there to guide you. The Qur'an has been explained to you. Then Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ Perhaps you may understand, perhaps you may ponder. Allah then continues in verse 2, 43. أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ لِيَارِهِمْ وَهُمْ أُلُوْفًا حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ فَقَالَ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ مُوتُوا ثُمَّ أَحْيَاهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهُ لَذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ Allah says about Have you not seen to those who came out from their homes? وَهُمْ أُلُوفَ And they were in the thousands حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ Fear and death So Allah said to them, مُوتُوا Die Allah said to them, Die ثُمَّ أَحْيَاهُمْ Then Allah brought them back to life in Allah, Ladu Fadlin al Nas, where Allah is full of bounty, bestows abundant bounty on mankind. Walakina Akhara Nasi Layas Kurun, and but many, most of mankind, they, they are not grateful to Allah, they are ungrateful. This incident happened with a village called Dawardan, which is seven miles from Wasit, which is in Iraq. Allah says, Have you not seen to those who came out from their house? And they are in a thousand fear and death. Some say that they were 4,000, but majority mention that they were 10,000. They were in this village and a plague, an epidemic broke out. A, a disease and it started to, to reach the, most of the people. They started to die from their sickness. So these people, fearing that it might attack them, they run from their village. They run from their town. And they went to a land which they were taking to themselves, you know what, we will not hear, there's no sickness here, there's no disease here. So we'll be free, we will not be able to die here because we have to leave them alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they reach that place, Allah says, فَقَالَ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ مُوتُ Allah says to them, die. So when they came out from the city, then they die. When they reach the, towards the place, they consider to be safe. Allah says, die. And then after some time, the Prophet from among the Prophets passed by them. And he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring them back to life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them back to life. So this is the incident. In a more detailed situation, the salaf, the scholars of the past, they mentioned that these people, they were in the time of Bani Israel. So they were in the time of Bani Israel and the weather was not good. The weather had become very bad for them. And a sickness had broke out, an epidemic had broke out. So these 10,000, they came out, fearing that they might die. So they came out until they reached in the wilderness as a, a valley. When they reached this valley, they think to themselves that, yes, this is a safe place. We'll be safe now. And in this valley, there were two mountains on the two sides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they thought to themselves that they are safe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two angels. One on one side of the mountain, the right side, and the one on the left side of the mountain. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded these two angels to scream, to cry out loud. And when they made that scream or they cried out loud, every single one from the 10,000 died instantly. All of them died as if it's one person dying. So every single one of them falls at the same time and they passed away. They died. After some time, the people of the village whom they have left behind, and they were thinking that they would be safe, they heard of the situation that took place and they came out and they were going to try to bury them. But to bury 10,000 people at the same time, though, that was very difficult. So while trying to do that, they realized that it is impossible to do, so they just built a fence, a wall around them and leave them there. Leave them lying on, on the top of the surface. After some time, they, they rot and only bones were remaining. But for 10,000 years, a lot of bones all around scattered. And after some time passed, uh, a prophet known as Prophet Hizkiel, in English is known as Ezekiel. The Prophet Hizkiel, he was passing by and he saw this place devastated with only bones, only human bones lying. No one was buried, everybody was flat on the ground. When he saw that, he asked Allah, oh Allah, give them back life. So he asked Allah, he made to Allah to bring them back to life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, call out to them. Allah told Prophet his skill, he says, call out to them, Ayyatuhal idham, Ayyatuhal idham al baliya, inna Allah yakmuruka an tashtama'i. He says, O oh bones, O oh broken bones, he says, Verily Allah commands you to gather together, to come together as one. And then you see all the bones started to come together. Each person, their body, their bones started to attach to one another. Then he was commanded again to say, Ayyatuhal idam inna Allah ya'muruka an taqtasi lahman wa asaban wa jillan. O bones, verily Allah has commanded you to clothe clothe yourself with flesh and with nerves and with your skin. And then in front of his eyes, he saw that all of them, their, their, their flesh started to go back on their bones and their, their skin started to come on their, on their body. But yet they were dead because only their physical appearance came up. And then he was commanded at a third time, Ayyatuhal Izam, Inna Allah Ya'muru, the Ayyatuhal Arwa. O souls, inna Allah ya'muruka an tarjiu kullu rohin ila al-jasad. Says, O souls, Allah has commanded you to return to each one's body. So all the soul of each one was returning towards the body and then they stood up. All of them, the entire 10,000 of them stood up alive looking on. And when they realized that Allah has brought them back to life, they all said, Subhanaka la ilaha illa anta. Glory be to you, there is no God but you. Glory be to you, Allah, there is no God but you. And then <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to them in order to show us as a lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of bringing back us to life as well as Yom al -Qiyama. Because sometimes there are many Muslims who believe in Allah, believe in Islam, but to believe in Allah bringing you back to life, some of them are in doubt. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to show that definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to bring back the dead to life. And that is why Allah says, Inna Allah ladu fadlin ala nas. Verily Allah is full of bounty, bestows abundant bounty on mankind. Allah has bestowed many bounties on everyone. Not only those people in the past, those that he brought back to life, but each and every human being Allah keeps on blessing them with his favors and his bounties every single day of our life. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after acknowledging that Allah gives you so much of bounties both in your dunya and your deen. Allah gives us a lot of blessings in our deen. Most of us, we do not know how valuable our Islam is. Sometimes we are Muslims and we do not realize how great Allah has given us our Islam. Because there are, look at the amount of people out there who are not Muslims. Who are born as unbelievers, they are born in a Christian home. And they grow up as being Christian in their entire life until they die as being Christian. And some of us would never ask to be Muslim, but yet we were born in Muslim homes. And because we're born in a Muslim home, we grow up as knowing about Islam, knowing about who is Allah, knowing about our Prophet. 
And yet sometimes when we get older, we start to neglect Allah, we start to neglect our religion, not realizing how great favor Allah has given us. So Allah says He has bestowed favors both in our deen as well as our dunya. Our dunya affects all the other things Allah has given us. Allah has given us health, Allah has given us wealth. Allah has given us a family, Allah has given us home, Allah has given us job, every single thing. But Allah says, after recognizing that Allah has given us everything, Allah says, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ But most of mankind are ungrateful to me. Most of mankind are ungrateful. They are not grateful for what I have given them. They are not grateful for the Islam. They are not grateful for their life. They are not grateful to Allah for the health which He has given them. They are not grateful to Allah for their job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا لَا يَشْكُرُونَ And this story also teaches us that with how much we are cautious of death, we are doing things not to die, we cannot stop destiny. Whenever our time reaches, that is it. If you are to lock up in our homes and say, what I know how to drive because I am afraid I might get into an accident. Whenever your time comes to, to die, whatever date is written for you, that is it. However, Allah says that you will have to die if Allah had decreed for you that you will die in an epidemic or in a plague, then you will have to die like that. So however Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed it, that is how it will come to pass. It was mentioned that, Ibn, that Umar anhum, Umar bin al-Khattab, he came out and he was going to Sham, to Syria. And when he reached by Sarq, he met some of the leaders he met, the, sorry, he met the leader of the army, Abu Ubaid bin al-Jarrah. And Abu Ubaid bin al-Jarrah, he informed him that there's a plague, there's an epidemic that has broke out in Syria because he was going in Syria. He told him that right now in Syria there's an epidemic. And Abdurrahman bin Auf, at that time he was absent. And when he came up and he heard of the situation that Abu Ubaid bin al-Jarrah is saying that there's an epidemic in Syria, he says to Umar bin al-Khattab that I heard Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, إِذَا كَانَ بِأَرْضٍ وَأَنْتُمْ بِهَا فَلَا تَخْرِجُوا فِرَارًا مِّنْهُ If you are in a village or you are in a land and there is an epidemic, then you should not come out to flee from it. There is a disease and there is a plague and you are in that country, you should not run away from that country, you should stay there. And it says that if you are out of it, you are in, a next, you are in your country and another country is Facing that epidemic, you should not go into it. You should not go into it. You, you, you should not know that, yes, so and so, there's this sickness going around and say, no, I'm going to still go in there. But Jesus Allah says, no, you should not go. Stay where you are. And upon hearing this, Umar, and who he left, and he turned back and he went to Mecca. <coughs> he went to Medina. So here, <coughs> The reason Rasulullah has mentioned that if you are in this area which a plague or epidemic has broke out, you should not come out from it because by coming out from it, you will spread it to others. You will spread it to the people and those people will blame you even though it might be that death was prescribed for them at that time, they will not look at it in that way. They will think that it's because you leave that place and you have come here, you have brought that sickness. So they will start to blame you instead of blaming that this is destiny. And for example, for you to spread it as well, you should not do that. You should stay there. And if it is decreed that you die there, you die there. If it is decreed that you pass over it, you will survive. And then as for those who are not in it to go there, because sometimes you, you are healthy and you, you leave your country which has no epidemic, has no plague, and you go on into that country and it so happens that you pass away. First thing your family will say, they will say it is because you went there, that is why you died. Not because Allah, it is your time or it's because you went there, you died. If you were remaining here, you would not have died. So for people to have those kind of thinking, Allah subhanahu and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa has said, no, do not go to those places. Stay in your own place, stay in your own land. And then Allah says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah says, and fight in the path of Allah. Just before talking about this story about the epidemic and plague and not running from that, Allah now encourages us to fight in the path of Allah, encouraging the Sahabas to fight. Allah is telling them that just as how, no matter how cautious you are, 
you cannot avoid destiny, you cannot avoid your death, you cannot stop your death. Similarly, if you're in the path of Allah, you're fighting in jihad, then you should not run away as well. If it's your time to die, you will die. If it's not your time to die, you will not die. So if you're fighting in the path of Allah, you should not flee from the battlefield. You should not run away. You should not think that by me not going to fight. You should not think that by me not going to fight, I will live longer. Or if I go to fight, I will, my, my lifespan will be shorter. You should not think like that. But you should think whenever the time comes, that is the time for you. So you go out and you fight whenever your time up, that is it. As mentioned in another ayat, Allah says, "Alladina qalu li ikwanihim wa qardu." There were some munafiks who, when the time for jihad came, they used to remain back. They did not want to go forward. So, when those some of the believers passed away and the others came back, they were saying to those to the survivors that if these other people, law ata'una ma qutilun, if they had only listened to us and stayed back with us, they would not have died. That is those martyrs. They have been martyred in the path of Allah in the battlefield. These people are saying the Munafik, the hypocrites, if they had listened to us and they had stayed back with us, look, we are still alive. If they had stayed back in their homes, they would not have died as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Kul fadra'u an anfusikum al maut in kuntum sadiqin. Allah says to the believers to say to those Munafik, say to them, let them stop death from coming to them. If they are saying that because they didn't fight, they are alive, then let them not let death come to them at all. Let them stop death from coming to them if they are truthful. And another ayat Allah says, وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا لِمَا قَتَبْتَ عَلَيْنَا الْقِتَالِ And they said, oh Lord, why are you prescribing on us to fight? لَوْ لَا قَرْتَنَا إِلَىٰ أَجْرٍ قَرِيبٍ If only you had leave it off for a few more years, for a longer time. Leave it off. Allah says, Kul matau dunya khalil. Say that the enjoyment of this life is little. Wal akhiratu khayru liman istaqa. And the hereafter is better for those who fear. Wal atu dhulamuna fatila. You will not be unjust. You will not be judged unjustly. Then Allah says, Aynama takunu yudrikum al mawtu walau kuntum fi burujim mushayyara. Allah says, Wherever you are, death will come to you. Death will meet you. Even if you are locked up in your homes, if you have your build, huge building, that will still come to you whenever the time reaches for death to come to you. And that is why Khalid bin Walid, the leader of the, the army, of the Muslim army, he was known as Sayyid Allah, the sword of Allah. Battles after battles, he would be fighting, and yet he was not martyred. He was on his sick bed. And people who would come and visit him, he would raise his garment to show them, look at their monks. There was no part of his body except that there were cuts and there were wounds from him fighting. There were marks of him in battles. And he would say, look, I've struggled so much and I've had this desire to be martyred. And yet I'm going to die as how a camel dies. I'm going to die in my home as how a camel dies. And then he says, let not... He says, let not the, the eyes of the cowards sleep. Let those cowards never sleep. Those people who are cowards and do not want to fight. And let them take an example. That is when Allah is ready for you, that is when you will go. It is not because of fighting or not fighting will keep you alive. It is when Allah says it is time for you, only then you are allowed to go. You cannot go one minute before time, you cannot go one minute after the time. You will go on the specific time. Next time Allah says, وَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرَضًا حَسَّنًا فَيُدَائِقَهُ لَهُ عَدَعَافًا كَثِيرًا Allah says, who is there that will lend Allah a loan, that will give to Allah a loan, a good loan, so that Allah will multiply it many times for you? Who is there that, to give Allah a loan? Here Allah is encouraging his servants now to spend in the path of Allah. So the idea for Allah is encouraging us to what fight. Allah is encouraging us to fight. Now Allah is encouraging us to spend. When you are fighting, do not think that you will die fast. When you are spending, do not think that you will get poor fast. Do not think poverty will come to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us now to spend. It is mentioned from Abdullah bin Mas'ud anhu. He says, when this ayat is revealed, man dalladi yukradullah karadhan hasanan. Abu Dahda al-Ansari, he came to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, 
sallallahu alaihi wasallam verily that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs a loan from us that Allah needs a loan and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam says naam ya abu dahsa yes o abu dahsa Allah needs a loan Allah wants you to give him a loan he says ya rasulullah stretch out your hand and he took his hands and he placed it in the hands of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says i'm going to give Allah a loan I have two gardens, I'm going to give Allah all two gardens. That is my loan to Allah, I'm going to give him two gardens, my two gardens. Rasulullah SAW told him, no, keep one. Put one for Allah and keep one for yourself and your family. He says, I'm going to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best one, the best of the two gardens. I have one garden that has 600, 600 nafla, 600 day palms. Take that one. And Rasulullah SAW took that one and then he went home, Abu Dahda went home, and he was so happy that he has given Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He went home and he was joyously saying to his wife, I have just done so and so. I have just given Rasulullah one of my gardens, the best garden. You know, sometimes a wife, she hears that and says, the quarrel, you give away the best of all, you could have given the worst one. But she was a sahabi as well. She was happy as well. She was happy that Abu Dahra has given the best which he has given because she understood the blessings that will come to it, come from it. So Qardan Hassanan, according to some, a good loan refers to nafqatun fi sabilillah, spending in the path of Allah. Others say it also means spending on one's family. So when you say giving a loan to Allah, it could be to, to spend or to do good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in another ayat, مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِكُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلَ اللَّهِ The likeness of those who spend their wealth in the path of Allah كَمَثُلِ حَبَّةٍ is like the example of a grain of corn. Like the example of one grain of corn. أَمْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابٍ You give one grain of corn, like you give one dollar Allah is saying, it's like this one grain of corn, أَمْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابِلَ that have seven ears. Seven ears grow from that one grain. And in each ear, he says, In each ear, there are 700. Sorry, in each ear, there is 100. So 100 by the seven ears gives you 700. By you given one, Allah multiplies 700 times. Allah gives you 700 for one. For one dollar that you give, Allah gives you 700 blessings. And even more, because Allah says, Other often kathira, many more than even that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. The loan here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about refers to good deeds and spending for his cause. Not that Allah needs anything because Allah is the owner of everything. Everything belongs to Allah. But why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word loan here is because when you take a loan, it is a custom that you have to pay back. You have to pay back the loan. So if you give an individual a loan, you are expecting that this individual will pay you back. Pay you back for what he has borrowed from you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you give a loan to Allah, you do good deeds, and Allah will repay you. So you do your good deeds, it's like a loan, you are done, you are doing your good deeds for Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repay you, Allah will repay you with good deeds. So that's why Allah used the term loan, by saying you do good deeds, Allah will repay you as how a loan is being repaid. It does not mean the actual loan. You give Allah your good deeds, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you with goodness in the akhirah. Some of the opinion that loan here could also mean the actual loan. When Allah says to give a good loan, it could also mean giving a loan in the cause of Allah. For example, somebody is very needy, somebody is very in a tight situation, and you're able to assist them with a loan, then to do that as well is as if you're giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a loan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repay you. As it is mentioned in a hadith, Mamin Muslimin. يُقْرِنُ مُسْلِمًا قَرْضًا مَرَّةً There is no Muslim that gives a loan to another Muslim once except that is as if he has given charity twice. He gets the blessings as if he has given charity twice. So to give charity, to give a loan, you're getting more blessings than giving given charity because you're helping an individual in the time when he really needs it. <laughs> Ibn Arabi, he says there are three groups after this. Ayat will reveal there were three groups of people. One, that when they heard this, the which was the unbelievers, they were mocking at it. They would say, your God is poor. Allah is poor, Allah wants a loan. And we are rich. 
So Allah needs Allah needs our money, Allah needs us. So there are those unbelievers who start to mock at the ayat and start to say Allah Allah is poor. Allah says لَقَدْ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ قَوْلُ الَّذِينَ قَوْلُ إِنَّ اللَّهُ فَكِيرُ وَنَحْنُ أَغْنِيَةُ Really Allah hears those people who are saying that Allah is poor and we are rich. So that was the first of the unbelievers. The second are those who heard the ayat but yet they were because of their miserliness they still never give anything for Allah. And those believers who they heard it, they understand it but because of their greed and their miserliness they still didn't give anything. And the other sports category are those who spend generously for the cause of Allah, like Abu Dahda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Umar bin al-Khattab, he says, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, whoever enters the market and he recites, La ilaha illallah wahdu, la sharika lahu, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamdu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes to him a thousand good deeds. And Allah removes from him a thousand evils, a thousand sins which he has committed. It's mentioned that when this ayat was revealed, the ayat about the grain of corn, the ayat that says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies it 700 times. When that ayat is revealed, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Rabbi zid ummati. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, my Lord, increase for my ummah. Increase it more than that. And then Allah revealed this ayat, man dalladhi yukrizu Allah qaradan hassanan. Who is it that will give a loan to Allah, a good loan that Allah will multiply it a lot more. Meaning a lot more than 700 times. And when that ayat was revealed, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he still say, Rabbi is it ummati. My Lord, increase for my ummah. Give them even more than that. And then Allah revealed, Innama yuwafa sabiruna ajrahum bi ghayri isab. That verily the rewards for the sabirun will be given. The recompense for the sabirun, the reward will be given without any accounting, without any reckoning. So will get that among that nobody could even think about. So this was different stages which was given. Then Allah says, Wallahu yaqbitu wa yaqtutu. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decreases and Allah He increases. Means Allah increases your increases your wealth for you, Allah decreases your wealth. Allah is in charge. So if you give or you do not give, it is Allah who will either increase for you or Allah will either decrease for you. Wa ilayhi turjaun and to him is your return. Thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. Verse 246, Salam tara ila al-malayhi min bani Israel. Have you not seen to the malak, to the chiefs or to the group of bani Israel? Min ba'di Musa, these were those from bani Israel who are from after Musa alayhi salam, min ba'di Musa. It qalu li nabiyya lahum, whom they said to their prophet, to a prophet, to them, Ibaat lana malikan, appoint for us a king. No qatil fi sabilallah, we will fight in the path of Allah. Qala hala asaytum in kutiba alaykum al kitalu Allah to fatiru. This Prophet said to them, he said, perhaps if kital is and fighting is really prescribed for you, you will not really want to fight, you will not fight. They said, Qalu wa ma lana Allah no qatilu fi sabilallah. Why is it that we will not want to fight when? When we are dispelled from our homes, we are separated from our children. Allah says, when kital and fighting was really prescribed upon them, Allah says, they turned away except a little, a few from them. And Allah is all knowing of the zalimin, the wrongdoers. This, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is preparing this, these items revealed before the Battle of Badr. As you know, the Battle of Badr was the fourth battle to be fought in Islam. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing the Sahabas for the Battle of Badr because this, what he's mentioning, is something similar to what took place in Badr with the numbers and the armies and everything that took place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gearing them up for the Battle of Badr. And this is the only place in the Quran Allah mentions this story. This is the only place Allah mentions about this story. And he says, Alam tara ila al-mala. Have you not looked at those who are the mala? Have you not seen towards the mala? Do you not know of the mala? Mala is translated as the chief. 
Mala means to fill. Mala yamlau means to fill. If you are filling something, you use the word mala. And that is why in even the hadith, if you write when Rasulullah Sallam, when the angel came and he washed his heart, then he says, Wa mala, he fills his heart with so and so. The word mala is used there also. But here, the original word means to fill. And here it is used for ministers because ministers are those who fill the court of the king. They normally fill the court of the government. So because they normally fill those spaces, Allah used the word mala for them as meaning the chief. And they were considered to be the most influential people, the most wealthier. Those people who are on top, who are considered to be the ministers, they are the highest in rank and highest in position in the, in the, among the community. So these people now, this was after the time of Musa, they set a prophet. They are saying to the prophet to appoint a king for us. Imagine there is a prophet among them. They want a king, but they don't want to ask the prophet to be a king to be the ruler over them. They don't want the prophet to be the ruler over them. Because they are wealthy, they have high position, they are high ranking, the prophet is poor. But they know he has spiritual, he, is, he has been given revelation from Allah. But these, they wanted the position for themselves. All of them, all the chiefs, they wanted to be the king. And there's kind of everybody wanting the position of being the king, they do not know what to do now. Say if we fourthly appoint somebody from amongst ourselves as well, the ordinary people will not accept us. Say if a man from among this ten chiefs, they have a vote, and they vote to see who will be the king, then the ordinary people, they will not want to, to listen to us. So what they did, they went to this prophet now, thinking to themselves, if the prophet was to choose one of us, not to choose anybody else, if the prophet choose one of us, then one of us will get the position of being the king as well as the people are wrong, they will also accept us. So we'll go to the, to the prophet and ask him to appoint a king. So they went to him and they said that the reason we want a king so that we are able to fight in a path of Allah, he says, Qala ahla He says, because he knew them good. And we'll go to the story just now of how this prophet came about. Sometimes if we get a king, if you get a king and he tells you to fight, you might not want to fight. He says, no, we will definitely fight. It is mentioned that this prophet, Allah did not mention his name here. Allah did not mention his name, Allah just said, a Nabiyan, a prophet from among them. According to Mujahid, he says, this prophet, his name was Shamwil. The prophet by the name of Shamwil. Shamuel, which in translated in English is known as Samuel. So the prophet by the name of Samuel, and this was by majority of the Mufasir, they mentioned that this incident, it is known as the prophet Samuel. Shamuel, which is known in Arabic. They say, to go in depth to the story, and this is according to the, the Israelites. The Banu Israel, after Musa alayhi salam, some of them, they were still on obedience. They were still following the teaching because Musa alayhi salam passed away. So some of them, as soon as he passed away, they were still on guidance until after some time, they started to innovate. And by innovating now, they started to worship idols. And after some time, because they had the Torah, any battle they fought, they used to win. Because they had the Torah, they had something known as the Tabut. Tabut is a special box that had some of the, the remainings of Musa salam, and Harun salam. So they used to have this box with them and the Torah and these two things used to, they used to say that this is good luck for them and they used to win as a means of motivation for them. But after some time because of them worshipping idols, they started to lose some battles. And one king he came and they were having a battle with the same Israelites and they overpowered the Israelites, they defeated the Israelites. And just uh, they took away the Torah from them as well as the Tabu. So they took away their good luck. And when they took away the Torah, most of them did not memorize the Torah. Some of them had no different, different passages, but they had known only a few among them. And then among them, from the lineage that the prophets used to normally come, there were no males alive at that time. 
that come in from the lineages of the prophets for them to hope that they will get another prophet, they get another book, another scripture. But there was just this one female from that descendant. She was pregnant and her husband had just died in the same battle. So they took her and they, they house arrest her, locked her up in her house. And they would give her food and everything, but they say that they hope that Allah makes whatever is in your stomach, whatever is in your belly, may Allah make that a profit for us, that it will help us to get back our taboos and to get back the Torah. So they wanted that this child be a prophet. So she was locked up in there, being there, she also from among them, she was praying that Allah did really give her a prophet. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me a prophet, that's a prophet born as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did allow a prophet to born. And when that prophet was born, she named him Shamuel. And Shamuel, the meaning of Shamuel or Samuel means Sami Allahu Du'a'i. The meaning of that is, may Allah, and the meaning of that is Allah has listened to my du'as, Allah has listened to my prayers. That is why he was given the name Shamuel, because Allah has listened to her prayers. So he grew up among them, he knew them very well. He knew this, these people good. Until he grew to an age, Allah granted him Nabuat and Allah granted him prophethood. After Allah granted him prophethood, he started to preach to them, to tell them to stop this idol worshipping. And when they heard all of that, they said, you know what, grant us a king. Appoint a king for us. They didn't want him to be a king because they know him from small growing up. And they were the hierarchy and he was just a small boy growing up among them. Very poor. So they say to, to give us a king, appoint for us a king. And this is what Allah says. Qalu wa ma lana alla nuqatil fi sabi lillahi wa qad ukhrijna min diyarina wa abna'ina. Allah says that they was, when he says sometimes you might not want to, to go and participate in the jihad. They will say to him why we won't want to fight. Look at how many defeats we had before. Look at how the people destroyed us, take away so much of our land separate us from our family, we'll definitely fight. And then Allah says, فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْكِتَابِ When fighting was really prescribed upon them, تَوَلَّوْا إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Most of them turn away except a little from them, and Allah knows the wrongdoers. Now, time for this prophet uh, to appoint for them a king. So they ask for the king, he has to appoint. قَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعْتَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتَ مَلِكًا he says to them, the pro- their prophet says to them, Verily Allah has appointed for you Salut as a king. Allah has appointed Salut. Salut is Saul. I say you well, Saul. So Allah appointed him. He said, I did not appoint him. He said, Allah appointed him. He's showing that I had no dealings in it to choose anybody. Allah chose Saul to be, to be the, the king. Next thing, Saul was only a soldier. He was not from among those who are rich. He was only in the army, in the military, so he was with just a normal soldier. He was not from the, the ancestors of those from the chief. He had no good lineage. So they reply when they heard that, they say, Kalu anna yakunu lahu muku alayna wa nahnu ahakku bil mulkimin. How is it that he can have kingdom? How is it that he could be the king when upon us when we are more deserving of it? We are more deserving to be king because all in all they were hoping that this prophet would choose one of them. But now the prophet chose besides one of them, they're saying we have the more authority to be king. We are the richest. We are the highest in position in rank. How is it that he could rule over us? And they say, Wallam yukta sa'ata min al mal. And they said to him, Look, this man you're saying that you want him to be the king. He was not given a large amount of wealth. He's not wealthy. And if you look at what they said, they didn't say he's not wealthy. They say he was not given an abundance of wealth. He's not, Allah did not grant it to him. So they are trying to say to the Prophet that wealth is a decree from Allah. Wealth is destiny. If Allah wants to decree that you get wealthy, Allah will make you wealthy. But Allah decreed that this man does not become wealthy. So because Allah didn't decree him to be wealthy, how is it that he could be a king? If Allah wanted him to be a king, Allah should have decreed that he become wealthy. So they were using it in that sense, that Allah needs to decree this. Then he says, so when they, they mention the fact why is it that this individual should not be a king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, 
This individual is that that in Allah subhanahu alaykum. Allah has chosen him for you. I did not choose him for you. I did not make this up. Allah has chosen for you. And Allah is doing it's safa. It's safa come for us. Safiyun. Safiyun means pure. Allah has chosen because he's purer than all of you. He has more good intentions than all of you. His character is better than all of you. So that's why Allah chose him over you. Istafa alaykum Allah. And then he says, وَزَّادَهُ بَسْتَةً فِي الْإِرْمِ And Allah had granted him, وَزَّادَهُ Allah increased him with abundance of knowledge. Allah has granted him plenty of knowledge. He has knowledge. has knowledge how to rule over you. He has knowledge that in case you are going in a battle, he has knowledge how to, how to set the army, how to go about in tactics. Allah says, you have given him that knowledge. So that's why we want him to be the king. Not only that, but wajism. Allah had made him, and Allah had increased him in size, meaning he was very well built. You know, for somebody to be the, the king and very small, small built people will take advantage. So Allah is saying, not only that he has the knowledge, but he is also well built. He is able to lead you into battle, into, into fighting your enemies. And then Allah says, Wallahu yukti mulkuhu man yasha, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he grants his kingdom to whoever he wishes. Allah makes king whoever he wants. Wallahu wazir alim, and Allah is all wazir, all alim. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, he says, Wa qala lahum nabiyyuhum. Now they are to ask the prophet, we need a sign to show that Allah really appointed this person. You are saying that Allah gave him knowledge, Allah gave him good body. We need a sign now to, sh- to be certain that this man was really sent, was really chosen by Allah. So the Prophet said to them, verily the ayat, an ayat and a sign that he is your king is that he will bring to you the tabut, the tabut that you lost, the tabut that the king carried away. Says he will bring you the tabut, and how? And the tabut fihi sakina to mi rabbikum. The sakina will be, there will be sakina in the tabut, in the box from your Lord. Wa bakiyatu mi mataraka ala Musa wa ala Harun, and the remnants of what the people, the family of Musa and the family of Harun has left. Then he says, Sahmiluhul malaika, the angels will be carrying it. Allah says that the box will come to you. Your tabut will come to you. But Allah did not use the word ja'a. You know the word ja'a means to come. Allah did not say ja'a to come at tabut. The tabut will come to you. When you use the word ja'a, it's for when you're going to come with some difficulty. After facing some difficulty, you're going to come. You're going to make sure you get the transportation. You're going to do this. But when Allah says, yes, come, it will come to you without any difficulty. You don't have to fight to get back your tabut. You don't have to cross oceans to get back your tabut. That tabut, that box will come to you. <coughs> it says, and in that tabut, they will have sakina, they will have tranquility. And also the, those things that Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam had left behind. And that is... The Asa, the staff of Musa alayhi salam, the staff of Harun alayhi salam, the remaining tablets that were there, some of manna. The manna was given to Bani Israel, some of the seeds were kept in that box. So some of that will be there, some clothing of Musa, a pair of clothing of Musa, clothing of Harun, as well as the sandals of both of them. The footwear of Musa and the footwear of Harun. And as we mentioned, that they used to use it as a means of good luck. Anytime they are going to fight, they will used to keep that. So that this is the Prophet, Prophet Musa, Prophet Harun, Ramadan. This will help us in our task. Allah says, Tahmiluhul Malaika. The angels will be carrying it. The angels will be carrying it. And Ibn Abbas says, The angels came down from the heavens. Came down from the heavens in front of Talut. Came down in front of Saul and placed the box right in front of him while the people were watching. So they saw that box coming down from the heaven that they had lost, coming up from the sky, and it stopped immediately in front of Saulus to show that Allah had chosen him. And then when they saw that, they believed in the prophethood of, of Prophet Samuel as well as they started to obey Saulus. And Allah says, Inna fi 
إن في ذلك لا آية لكم إن كنتم مؤمنون أو إن كنتم مؤمنين. Brethren, that is a sign for you if you are from among the believers. Next, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala continues. Allah says, "Salam ma sabtala salu kabil jinuri." When Salu set out with his army, he says, "Inna Allah mubtalikum mina hal." Very Allah is going to test you with this river. Now they are going. It was mentioned that there are eighty thousand of them, eighty thousand soldiers. They are going to face the, the enemy. So it's ten thousand. And he says to them, after this long journey, the water supply has gone. He says Allah is going to test you with a river that is coming up. Now, if you are so thirsty and you see a river, you want to fill up everything, you want to quench your thirst, you want to drink plenty of water. Now, he's telling 80,000 of them, Allah is testing you with this river that is coming up. And he says to them, from Ansharika Minu, whoever drinks from it is not from me. When you see that river and you want to drink, and if you drink from it, you're not from me. Not from me means you have to go back. You cannot go forward to fight with me. And he says, who do not taste from it, for malam yet anhu, fa innahu minni. Whoever does not taste any from it, he's from me, except those who only take a palm, one handful of water alone. That is the amount you are able to drink. If you drink more than one handful of water, you're not from amongst me. So all they were allowed to take is one handful of water. For Sharibu Minho illa Khalilan, they all drank except a few of them. When they reached there, they did not worry about Salu, they see water in abundance, they started to drink. And most of them, from 80,000, it remained to 310 only. So from 80,000, all of them drank, and those who drank plenty, they thought it wasn't quenched. And those who only drank that one handful, they thought was quenched. Because they obeyed the Prophet, they, they're not the Prophet, they obeyed Salud. And the reason for doing it is to show that in any army they need discipline. Need discipline. And Allah wanted them to be disciplined. Remember, everybody just before was fighting for position, everybody wants to be leader. Now when they go and they saw a big army, and they start to, they start to run away, they start to flee from the army, they say, no, we're not going there. Then all those 310 individuals who are there, who are really true, want to fight. Those, they were also, have their moral will start to drop as well. They start to say, we cannot make it, look, everybody has gone. So Allah, before they reached the army, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured us, removed all those who might flee from the army. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leave them with 310. And this is the amongst them. It is not means closely to those who are in Badr. Some narration is 300, some narration is 310 in Barra. And that is the same amongst, and they're going to reach a huge army. So now after they cross with only 310 and they reach in front of the army, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا جَاوَدَهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا قَالُوا لَا تَقَطْلَنَا الْيَوْمَ بِجَالُوهُ جُنُورِ They said, when they cross, and those who believe, so those and those who believe, those, some of them decide to say, today we have no power over the army of Jalut. Jalut is known as Goliath. We have no power over him. Look at, look at that army. Now if somebody jumps up and says that, everybody starts to feel that, yeah, we can't, we can't really make it. Everybody starts, the, the esteem starts to go down. <coughs> so he says, La ta qatlan al yawmi Jalut al jururi. And then those, call al ladina yadunnuna anna hum malakullahi. And those who are really higher in the Iman, they say, Come in Siyatin Khalilatin Ghalabat Siyatin Kathiratin Bidhinillah. Look at how many small groups defeated large armies. Look at how many small groups defeated large armies by the permission of Allah. Wallahu ma'asabirin and Allah is the Lord of Allah. So at the time of the will have to continue. The remaining of the story next week in Shah. I subhanahu wa bihamdi, subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bihamdi, wa shiru wa la ilaha ilaha anta, wa shakfu wa ta'ala wa shiru wa ilayhi, subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bihamdi, wa shiru wa ta'ala 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 wa shiru wa ta'ala